Willkommen, meine Freunde, to our first venture into the top 40 for the year they say that rock music peaked. Well, the top pop picks from 66 match the quality of the quality of the albums that stand forever in greatness. The answer is a resounding yes in the week ending July 24th, 1966. Sliding down the charts this week is number 10, courtesy of the rather unfortunate Crispin St. Peter and The Pied Piper. Rather unfortunate because at the height of his fame with the top five single in the US, the UK, Australia and hitting number one in Canada, he declared himself to a teeny bopper magazine to be more talented than Sammy Davis Jr., a better songwriter than Lennon and McCartney, and more exciting than Tom Jones, and furthermore that the Beatles stage act was rubbish. Unsurprisingly, his next single flopped, as did every other single after that. Pity. The Pied Piper is a fun little record. Number 9 is one of the songs that earned the title Soul Standard. Percy Sledge is immortal when a man loves a woman. The subject of more awful cover versions than I care to count, this was as high as it got here and a bare month later, it was gone from the charts. But not from our hearts. Number 8. There can be few people who have any familiarity with this channel who do not know of my abiding and undeviating love for Dusty Springfield. In my mind, along with Sam Cooke and Patsy Cline, the greatest singer of the 1960s, Dusty here is heading out of the top 10 with her all-time classic, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. Massive in every aspect, this tune came from an Italian song festival Dusty attended and the lyrics were written by Vicky Wickham and Simon Napier Bell in the backseat of a cab on the way to a nightclub in a deliberate attempt to write the worst love song ever. They failed abysmally, instead succeeding in writing one of the very greatest songs of the 1960s. Number 7 is the runt of this week's litter, a record that in a fortnight would claim the number 1 spot, BJ Thomas's mawkish and trite mama. The less time I spend talking about this record, the more time I can spend talking about actually good records, so beyond Thomas's sometimes startling vocal resemblance to Cliff Richard, let's move on. Number 6 is a local legend Normie Rose cover of Marvin Gaye's Pride and Joy. Normie follows Marvin's blueprint pretty well. He's not in Marvin's class as a singer, but he brings a bit of grit and a bit of funk to it. Hugely popular, racking up 10 top 10 hits in two and a half years, Rose's career was scuppered at its peak when he was drafted into the Australian Army and sent to Vietnam. On his return, he rebuilt his career in the theatre and television, forging an impressive resume and being such an outspoken advocate for Vietnam veterans. If there's any such thing as a national treasure here in Australia, then Normie Rowe fits the bill. Fee fi fo fum, I've got facts that you'll find fun. Follow me, find friends through Fowl's fantastic world of facts. Biggest mover this week on the charts is Mr. Smooth, Matt Munro with Born Free, debuting at number 22 and bound for the top five weeks later. Simon and Garfunkel's I Am A Rock went stone cold this week, falling 10 spots towards dark oblivion, to be replaced on the charts by the desultory dangling conversation, which made number 85. The longest running song on the chart was Bob Lynn's Elusive Butterfly, which he'd been on for 16 weeks. Lynn was a gifted songwriter, but was apparently very difficult to work with, and that stilted his career. The fact that he's paired on this record with producer Jack Nietzsche probably puts two very difficult to work with people in the same room. It's amazing that they got out alive, let alone made a record that lasted for 16 weeks on the charts. There were only two X number one singles on the charts this week, a Roger Miller song, Hitchhiker, by Melbourne duo Bobby and Laurie, and the legendary Easy Beats, the band that gave us Harry Vander and George Young and the Albert Empire of the 1970s and 1980s with Come and See Her. This leads us to an interesting thing about this week's charts, the brevity with which songs are staying on the chart. If we look at the previous top 10 we surveyed from 1978, the average spell in the top 40 was 9.2 weeks. This week it's 6 weeks. It may simply be that there was more 
competition for spots in the top 40, but look at the 1978 charts, there was plenty of quality music moving up the charts, but it was moving up more slowly and hovering around its peak for longer. The 1978 list had an unchanged top two for six weeks and top three for four weeks. It's very curious and it's something I'd like to pay more attention to and work out a bit of a formula for. Number five is Painted Black by the Rolling Stones. I'ma just come out and say this, this isn't one of my favorite Stone songs. For all of Brian Jones's sterling efforts with the sitar to color the dull droning melody and over bassy mix, the song is still a bit of a chore, especially with that confused and unappealing ending. To me, it's the end of the Stones' golden run of singles through the mid 60s, which was not to be revived until Jumping Jack Flash some two years later. Tearing it up at number four this week is Wild Thing by The Trogs, a song written by the irascible Chip Taylor who wrote such as Angel of the Morning for Merrily Rush, I Can't Let Go for Linda Ronstadt, Try Just a Little Bit Harder by Janis Joplin and Take Me For A Little While which Dave Edmonds did a great version of. Check out his album with Carrie Rodriguez, Let's Leave This Town, it's great. Anyway, Wild Thing, soon to be a number one single in these parts, is an all-time classic for bedroom beginner guitarists, pub bands, and even a bloke called Jimi Hendrix. At number three, we have a rare oddity, or an odd rarity, depending on your priorities, a Beatles single that not only never made number one, but didn't even make number two. And it's not some off-cut from an EP or odd here and there track released to malt money from teeny boppers. It's a proper canonical Beatle single. Paperback writer and it's glorious B-side rain. An aside, it only failed to make number one in my hometown. It did make number one on the National Kent Report. Recorded during the Revolver Sessions after Harrison's rather wonderful Love You Too, for those who like these things, the song does mark a change in the Beatles' sonic attack, featuring the debut of McCartney's Rickenbacker, a 1964 4001 S for those who like these things, and his 1964 Epiphone Casino, which a week later played the solo on Taxman and is still today his number one stage guitar. And Harrison bought out his 1964 Gibson SG. This added some sonic punch, particularly on the simultaneously recorded B-side Rain, which features all of the above, plus some utterly remarkable drumming from Ringo. So why didn't it make number one? I think John Lennon himself said it best. It's not one of our best songs, but it was the only one we had ready for the record release date. The Ariana Titmus of this week's chart is Tar and Cement by Verdell Smith, a record that probably deserves its own story in and of itself. A one and a half hit wonder, Smith pushed this to number one in Australia and went both top 40 in the US and Canada and possessed of what seemed like a bright future, promptly disappeared and no more was seen of her and no more was heard of her for over 40 years. That was until an ABC local program in Adelaide, which is the capital of the state of South Australia and the national capital for gruesome sex murders, took it upon themselves to use a colleague in New York City to see if he could find her. Eventually he did and she, surprised that anyone remembered her, gave her first interview since 1966 on ABC Radio. She turned out to be charming, funny, full of stories, accomplished and very happy. Her reason for quitting? she just didn't like the music business. She became a pastor and a teacher of disabled children, got no money from Tara and Cement, she didn't even know until a few years before that it had been such a hit in Australia. And she was, at the time, writing a book. More pragmatically though, she was a singer out of time, pure of voice and something of a throwback to perhaps the Lena Horne style of singer in a world which almost expected of black women, especially those with the church background, to be Etta James or Fontella Bass or an Aretha Franklin style singer. And the music business has a way of changing you into what it wants you to be. Verdell just wanted to be herself. She seemed very nice. We await the unveiling of the number one hit for this week. What will it be? Will the mighty Beatles and Stones or Dusty have a second hit up their sleeves? Or will it be some arcane one-hit wonder? One way to find out, Gene, thump your mighty tubs and bring in the victor. 
by it's none other than Doobie Doobie Doo. Strangers in the Night for Frank Sinatra. It was his first number one for 11 years, the title track to his biggest selling album, and he hated it. He never pulled back from telling people how much he hated it. There's also the amusing story told by Glenn Campbell of how Frank asked producer Jimmy Bowen to remove him from the session because he thought he was gay. Suitably reassured by Bowen that Campbell was just staring at Sinatra because he idolised him as a singer, Campbell managed to keep his chair. Whatever. As I always say, it's Frank's world and we just have to live with it. This record became to easy listening what Back in Black is to hard rock or Hoochie Coochie Man is to the blues. Hate it as he may have, Frank commands the relatively pinched melody with a calm, warm authority. He is the master of song and subject. Politically incorrect? Yes. A beckoning light back to the days when masculinity was not considered a disease. What a splendour. What a cornucopia we have had this week. I certainly hope that you enjoyed it and will join us next time we visit that most mysterious of foreign countries, the past. <laughs>